the live action Scooby Doo movies are in the wrong order and I can prove it. And to do so, let me take you back to the summer of 2002. I was nine years old going on 10 and I begged my parents to take me to see Scooby Doo the movie. I still remember the fantastic opening scene with the lunar ghost that captured everything I love about Scooby-Doo right down to elaborate traps that don't work but kinda work, to even more elaborate villain technology that somehow looked silly and rad at the same time. But then, immediately after that, the gang breaks up. Okay, that's a weird choice for the first movie in what I imagine WB hoped would become a franchise, but we'll put a pin in that for now. Eh, time passes and the gang is reluctantly forced back together to solve the greatest mystery of their careers. Actual monsters that defy reality. Supernatural curses and magical rituals and body swapping souls. Yeah, so this also feels like a weird choice for their first movie, but we'll just we'll just do another Another pin, please. And it all leads up to this climactic reveal that the villain Mystery Inc. has been fighting against this entire time, the one that lured them to and trapped them on this soul-sucking, spooky island is none other than... Puppy Power! Scrappy-Doo. Really? No, 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 this is all wrong. Let's put aside the fact that this reveal of Scrappy as an evil mastermind only happened because Scrappy has a history of being an unlikable character in the Scooby-Doo franchise. Now my stance on the boy is a little bit more nuanced than that, but suffice it to say that I'm not a fan of turning Scrappy into a villain for the sole reason that people find him to be a little obnoxious. But I guess, I guess it's better than pretending like Scrappy doesn't exist at all. Wow, I haven't seen... Look away, Daphne. We all promised each other that we would never speak of him. Not ever. Well, I guess the gang's all here. Except Scrappy. What's a Scrappy? But all right, whatever. Scrappy is a villain now. I can live with that. However, in my opinion, this villainous reveal doesn't even come close to the delicious, dramatic energy of this ghoul from the sequel. Mystery Incorporated! Once again, you have proven useless before my power! Mwah, magnificent. Arguably the best line delivery in all of cinema. To this day, I cannot say the words Mystery Incorporated without wanting to instinctively do it in that tone, which I will be fighting for the rest of this video. That is theatricality. That is a proper Scooby-Doo villain. Monsters Unleashed is by far the better of the two films. Not an opinion. That is a fact. Scrappy never stood a chance. He was always going to be upstaged by this delightful fellow. And maybe that's why this moment, this one villainous scene, if you will, doesn't really work for me. But it could have, it could have worked so dang well with one minor change. Perfect, video done. Wait, what just happened? So it appears I can't alter the canon of Scooby-Doo. At least, not on my own. Now I need a powerful, magical artifact on my side. An object that's as earth-shattering and reality-warping as... The Damon Ritus! Only a relic that ancient and mysterious could help me achieve my clearly benevolent goal. I think it's in a box around here somewhere. Okay. How are you doing, you wonderful nerd? Scott here, and it's gonna take me a while 
I predict, to find the Damon Ritus, so I should probably use this time to at least explain why I care so strongly about flipping the order of the Scoob films. It's a lot of reasons, uh, but let's start with the movie's settings. Scooby-Doo 2 Monsters Unleashed takes place in Coolsville. This is canonically where Fred, Daphne, Velma, Shaggy, and Scooby are all from, at least in most interpretations. Scooby-Doo Mystery Incorporated sets everyone's hometown as Crystal Cove, but that show gets a pass because it's a masterpiece. This setting is a perfect introduction to a first Scooby-Doo film. Not only do they set it in the familiar town from the cartoons where you can see the gang's influence as hometown celebrities, but there are all kinds of set pieces that harken back to classic Scoob. We're talking museums, we're talking abandoned mining facilities, we're talking the clubhouse from a pup named Scooby-Doo, and you know they have a gorgeous spooky mansion. How dare you doubt that they'd have a gorgeous spooky mansion? That's like my favorite set of the whole movie. The color palette, the textures, the way that everything has cobwebs despite the fact that someone actively lives here. It looks like it was ripped directly from the original original cartoons. Wickle's Manor is truly spectacular. Setting the story in Coolsville puts the gang and the audience in familiar territory. They're comfortable here. People of the town love Mystery Inc., but as their past triumphs come back to literally haunt them and the town, aided by Heather Jasper Howe's smear campaign against them, we see the citizens of Coolsville start to turn on Mystery Inc. Or should I say, mystery stink? How did you all coordinate these signs on such short notice? They all say the same like four things. Oh, the Chickenstein one's pretty clever though. I didn't see that till just now. <laughs> Scooby-Doo the movie, AKA Scooby-Doo 1, AKA what should really be Scooby-Doo 2, takes place instead on the theme park Spooky Island. I say on it and not in it because as the name implies, Spooky Island is land that is surrounded on all sides by water, which is what that is. That's what an island is. I do love this setting, don't get me wrong, but I don't know, an amusement park that turns its guests into soulless cult members is perhaps a little cliche of a hot take. I mean, I'm not a Disney adult, but I have friends who are and they seem, you know, I'll check on them. But the fact that this unsettling location traps the gang in place, unable to leave because, you know, it's an island, makes it terrifying. I mean, that's most of the reason why Zombie Island was so scary to me. The gang can't just drive away when things get horrible. They have to take the ferry, and guess what? The ferry driver's in on it. And they pull the exact same move on Spooky Island. When things start going south, the gang calls for help from the Coast Guard to get them off the island, but the Coast Guards are lit from below, all spooky-like, so I don't think they're gonna be much help, to be honest. Unlike Monsters Unleashed, this movie doesn't have any familiar set pieces. It's not as comfortable as Coolsville. And that's the point. But if you watch these movies in the order that they came out in, you get a story of the gang being thrown into completely new and unfamiliar territory first, and then the sequel puts them back in their home turf. Shouldn't it be the other way around? Start the Scoob crew in settings that feel instantly classic and identifiable to establish this world and then up the stakes in the sequel by taking them out of their hallowed ground and plopping them somewhere totally new. Spooky Island is unfamiliar territory, both in terms of a physical location and the mystery they're trying to solve. Because this time, the monsters are real. Which again is also the tagline for Zombie Island. They just wanted to make Zombie Island again. And get ready for Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island because this time the monsters are real. And that's okay. I mean, Zombie Island is a banger. But the reason why Zombie Island is so impactful is because it built off of the classic Scooby-Doo legacy where monsters were just people in masks. I've made um, uh, several videos explaining this further if you want to watch those, but the monsters in these films continue to add to my overall point. So let's talk about them for a second. 
Monsters Unleashed features iconic monsters from the classic Scooby canon. The Pterodactyl Ghost, Minor 49er, Captain Cutler's Ghost, the Tar Monster, the 10,000 Volt Ghost, which is by far the scariest one. The way that it rips through electrical currents to tear its way into existence is an effect that absolutely holds up, unlike some of the other CGI ghosts in this film that are showing their age. But thankfully, one of the ghouls that still looks great is the OG, the very first Scooby-Doo villain that kicked off the franchise, the Black Knight Ghost. Isn't this how you should start off this franchise? Uh, you're bringing a beloved and long-running cartoon series into the realm of live action, and you wait until the second movie to bring these classic creeps to life? Doesn't make sense. Also, a small thing, um, but you had the space coop right here in this museum and you didn't use him in this movie? He's my favorite Scooby monster for his unnerving laugh alone. Is it because he'd be too scary for children? Because if so, I get it. That design is spectacularly frightening. Kudos to the wizards who designed it because it's just a prop in the background of one scene. And I still think about it more than I think about any of these goofballs from the first movie. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with these creatures, except that they're supposed to be terrifying demons, but really they just kind of look like big hairless rabbits. You put them in a sweater, they're adorable. I'll take every one that you have, please. But my main problem with these monsters is that they're real. Oh, hey, look, it's one of those pins I mentioned earlier. And you're probably thinking, hold up there, Scott. The ghouls in Monsters Unleashed were also real. That was the whole premise. Why, oh dear hypocrite, do you praise those monsters for coming to life while poo-pooing, or should I say doo-dooing, on the also very real monsters from the first film? You fool, checkmate. I gotcha. That's the voice I read every comment in, and it's probably not healthy. And yeah, fair enough. But in my eyes, there's a difference between the, the realness, I guess, of the monsters in each film. In the first movie, the ancient demons are summoned to our reality by magic rituals involving the supernatural artifact, the Daemon Ritus, which I swear is around here somewhere. In Monsters Unleashed, however, the creeps are brought to life via science, not magic. Jonathan Jacobo grants sentience to the costumes of Scooby's past villains through a machine that harnesses the element randomonium, which, you know, obviously isn't a real thing in our world, but it's a real thing in the universe of the story. Now, I know that this feels like a subtle, insignificant distinction, and it is, but also, I promise it's not. The proof is in the very orange pudding. Nope, not a fan of how I phrase that. What I mean to say, the proof is, as I said, in the it's in the way that Velma reacts to each monster. <sighs> in Monsters Unleashed, she's scared of them, yes, but it never once breaks her view of reality as the team's biggest skeptic of the supernatural. Velma learns that these creatures are real, uncovers that they were bestowed life by scientific means, and is all, oh yeah, obviously. That makes sense to me. But in the first film, which again, really should come after the second film, Velma's first instinct is to try and unmask the demons, and when she can't, it shocks her. Earlier in the film, we see her insisting that magic rituals and ancient monsters are all a load of baloney. What a smart little one. But here, she's proven wrong firsthand. It's startling. It's world shattering. It's the kind of intense escalation that is right at home in a sequel. I mean, come on. Why would you start a franchise with the revelization? Revelization? Why would you start a franchise with the revelation that supernatural forces exist and then give the sequel an explanation for real monsters that is less thrilling than that? Going back to what we said about the settings of these films, doesn't it make the most sense to start this franchise in familiar territory before pulling the rug out from under Scooby and the gang? Why start them at a new location with new threats only to scale back in the next outing? It just doesn't make sense to me. The sequel should always try to expand upon the world set up by the first, not diminish it. Which brings me back 
to this moment. I'm a broken record at this point, I know, but Monsters Unleashed does a phenomenal job of setting up the world of classic Scooby-Doo, but it does so while also bringing in a brand new villain who steals every single scene they are in. Mystery Incorporated! Mystery Incorporated! Find me Mystery Inc. now! This is only the first run on the ladder of your demise. This time, you'll be the ones on last. Who do you think you are? Scooby? Scooby? Go! Holy sh! This guy's cool. Uh, he does have one little flaw, though, which is that none of you know what his name is. Uh, not a single one of you know what this legend's name is. And that is because he wasn't given one. The credits refer to him only as Evil Masked Figure. And what is up with movies doing this? Foregoing, bestowing a proper name to their best characters? I rewatched the Extremely Goofy movie a few months back, and do you remember? This icon? No one ever asked her what her name was. Unbelievable. My point is, Evil Masked Figure, or EMF, uh, we're close friends, so I'm allowed to call him that you are not, is a spectacular villain for a first Scooby-Doo film. A brand new character that channels the over-the-top spectacle of the classic monsters from the cartoons, and it's an actual mystery to solve with all kinds of suspects that seem equally likely to be the big bad. It in all culminates in a satisfying unmasking. This villain is a great first step into the franchise. And as Monsters Unleashed utilizes this villain to tell a heartfelt emotional story that centers squarely around the gang, a sequel film should take the characters we've established and expand their world. And that is why Scrappy makes for such a fantastic villain if this movie came out second. Why would you bring in a side character as a main character in the first film of the franchise? Even the Flintstones didn't bring in the Great Gazoo until Viva Rock Vegas. You bring Scrappy in for the sequel, and it shows how much bigger the gang's history is compared to what we previously knew in Monsters Unleashed. Literally, even Scrappy himself is bigger. By the way, did you know that this version of Scrappy, who's all jacked up on souls from the Damon Ritus, which I thought was somewhere in this room, is called Scrappy Rex? Yeah, these movies are just not great with names. With the exception, of course, of Melvin Dew. That bit never gets old to me. I got a call for a Mr. Dew. Uh, Melvin Dew? Nah, Scooby. I'm getting sidetracked. My point is, Scrappy being the big, bad, evil mastermind feels so much better and more rewarding in the second story because it unravels more of the gang's history and grander world. Why spoil that immediately? Why waste this one villainous scene up front? when we could savor it later and have that impact hit so much harder. There's a lot of stuff like that that feels utilized far too early in this franchise. I mean, the first movie starts with the gang breaking up and having to reunite to solve perhaps their greatest mystery yet. And hey, look, there's that other pin I talked about earlier. I would have loved to have seen more of Mystery Inc.'s story before they broke up. And yeah, I know it's implied that the cartoons are their story prior to this movie, but this specific cast was so stellar that I would have loved to see them fight off against a whole bunch of their classic foes to establish their loving relationships with one another before they disband, which is why you should watch Monsters Unleashed first. Now, I want to take a moment to prove to you how even the arcs of the individual characters of the Scoob Gang improve if we watch these films in reverse, because I'm nothing if not needlessly thorough. We already touched on how Velma's arc would improve if we see her first discover that monsters can come to life with science before shattering her rational mind by revealing that supernatural forces are just as real. I think that's great. Don't need to say much more about that. Now, a crux of Monsters Unleashed is how Shaggy and Scooby feel like they are screw-ups on the team, but at least they have each other which would set them up perfectly for emotional drama when Shaggy starts abandoning Scooby to spend time with his new love interest on Spooky Island. I'm Mary Jane. Like that is my favorite name. Really? Yeah. No way. 
Do you get it? It's a, it's a subtle joke, but you see Shaggy, you see, he likes to, Shaggy, I mean, he's a fan. He, Shaggy smokes pop. Or let's take Fred and Daphne's relationship across the two movies. Monsters Unleashed starts with them as a couple already. In fact, if you read the Monsters Unleashed novelization, which of course I have, it's specifically noted that the two are engaged. Wild. But that wouldn't make any sense if this movie came first, right? Because the two seem to just start up a romantic relationship with one another during the final moments of the first film, right? Yeah, you could read it that way, for sure. However, I've never really liked their kiss at the end of the first outing. It feels a bit forced to me. The two don't really build up any romance prior to this. Unless you take these movies in reverse order, then their story reads as partners who break up when their business disbands. And that's even more heartbreaking to me. So when they share a nice moment at the end of this film, it feels like their relationship is back on track instead of just sprouting up out of nowhere. Now, one small thing to note about Daphne is that she does use the break in the first film to learn how to fight, which does carry over to Monsters Unleashed. So if you watch the movies in reverse order, then that might seem off. But I think you could probably argue that Daphne was maybe always good at fighting, but just no one paid attention to her. So the fact that the gang doesn't recognize Daphne's innate fighting prowess could carry straight into the Lunar Ghost trap when she is annoyingly used as a damsel in distress. Uh, maybe that's part of why she gets so upset and leaves, vowing to become even even better at punch kicking. I, I don't know, use your imagination. I'm not gonna fill in every plot hole for you. What happened to Patrick? He was replaced by this guy. This is new Patrick. He was never given a name in the film, surprisingly. The credits call him Velma's friend because the initial script portrayed Velma as gay, which again, Monsters Unleashed would have set up better. Who's your mommy? I mean, even the titles of these movies feel reversed. In the first film, the gang realizes that the creatures they're fighting against aren't people in masks. Magic is real. Supernatural relics exist in our world somewhere in this room. Monsters are unleashed. Meanwhile, the second film is all about iconic Scooby-Doo monsters, quintessential locations from the franchise, and even a bunch of human characters pulled straight from the cartoons. Everyone at the faux ghost is from the cartoons. It even has that classic Scooby-Doo double unmasking where the evil masked figure is revealed to be Heather Jasper Howe, who is then revealed to be Jonathan Jacobo. If any film has earned the moniker of Scooby-Doo the movie, it's this one. It is positively dripping with Scoob vibes. I just, I wish I knew where I put the Damon Ritus so I could use its fantastic magical abilities to alter the timeline and invert the canonical way to watch these films. I've just, I I've looked everywhere. Except that box. You don't suppose. <sighs> the Damon Ritus. There it is. It's not a vegetable steamer. It's a mystic artifact filled with ancient power. And with its power coursing through my veins, I shall once and for all set the universe right. Finally, I've done it. I've solved the most pressing problem in the world right now. <laughs> yeah, so from now on, you can only watch these movies in this order. It's canon now. So update the wikis and tell James Gunn that I fixed his movies for him. That's right, he wrote these, which is a fact that I always forget. I'm 
basically a hero. And my soul can finally be laid to rest. That's right, I've been a ghost this whole time. Ooh, have fun unpacking that lore. Thank you so much for watching this video and for subscribing. I just assumed that you did that because why wouldn't you? There is a longer version of this video up on my Patreon uh, where I recast the main suspects from Spooky Island to be characters from the extended Scooby-Doo canon. Like for example, Emile Mondavarius, cool character, but what if instead that was Vincent Van Gogh. Just an interesting thought off the top of my head, but hey, if you want to see that plus more bonus content and some other cool stuff, uh, go support me over at patreon.com slash nerdsync, like all of the scrolling names wherever they are on the screen, including Amanda Trisdale, Christopher Lang, DeCassowary, Donna Bark, Edwin Latour, Eric Ketchum, Eric Totorapato, Everett Parrott, Jonathan and Megan Pearson, Jonathan Lenowski, LT O'Brien, and the rest of the wonderful nerds, uh, once again, over at patreon.com slash nerdsync. Link in the description. And hey, this video Video was part of the one villainous scene super collab uh, with a whole bunch of other uh, fantastic video essayists like Nando V Movies, Laura Crone, Ben from Canada. Oh my God, I'm the least cool person in this whole collab. There are so many others. Uh, everyone else did a much better job than I did. My video barely fits the prompt at all. There'll be a link to the entire playlist in the description as well. And also on screen right now, go click it. You don't have anything else to do for the rest of your day. You might, I don't know your story, but still. Once again, my name is Scott, reminding you that I would have gotten away with it if it weren't for those meddling kids. Bye.